Hello and welcome. I'm Stuart Craner, co-founder of Thinkers50. Every year, Thinkers50 inducts new management thinkers into its Hall of Fame, which is supported by our partners at the Hire Group. The Hall of Fame recognizes and celebrates thinkers who have made a significant long-term contribution to management thinking and practice. This year's inductees into the Hall of Fame are a stellar group, and it is a pleasure to recognize their contribution. Today, I'm joined by one of our new inductees, Margaret Heffernan. Margaret is an entrepreneur, chief executive, and author, and much, much more. She was born in Texas, raised in Holland, and educated at Cambridge University. She worked in BBC Radio for five years, and then as a television pr producer. In 1994, she returned to the United States, where she worked on public affair campaigns in Massachusetts and with software companies. Along the way, she was a CEO before beginning her book writing career. Margaret has published six books, the Naked Truth, A Working Woman's Manifesto, Women on Top, Willful Blindness, A Bigger Prize, Beyond Measure, and Uncharted, How to Map the Future Together, which explores how individuals and organizations can creatively and productively prepare for an unknowable future. Along the way, Margaret also mentors global business leaders and is a professor at the School of Management at the University of Bath. Margaret, Welcome. Um, look, looking back at your amazingly pr productive career, how do you make how do you make sense of it? Is, is there a pattern there? Is there a golden thread which uh, isn't discernible to the outside observer? Um, I think there's a bit of a golden thread. I mean, clearly there's um, a great appetite for change and exploration. Um, there's clearly a low boredom threshold. Uh, I think. I mean, I think I have always, always been fascinated by what makes some places a great place to work and other places really terrible places to work. And what does work mean? Um, and I mean, I think, I think, you know, I think I started asking questions like that, quite frankly. You know, when I was a child, seeing my father coming home from work, often angry, frustrated, fed up. Um, you know, work was a really important thing, but it didn't seem a particularly happy thing. So why was that? Um, and I've also always worked in situations where I was surrounded by incredibly creative people. And, and that, I think, was the real magnet. It was clearly true at the BBC. Um, it was true in all of the tech companies that I ran. Um, it's definitely true of my mentoring. And one of the great joys of writing a book is having an excuse to go and talk to people who, for one reason or another, I think are really creative and I want to understand more of, of what's driving them. And how do you understand work now? Because you, you've worked you've worked for yes. organisations like, I mean, the BBC is a certain type of organisation, especially when, when you work for it. And then you were... In, in the States as a CEO of tech companies and involved with the tech tech boom. And then, and then back here, writing books, working for yourself. Yeah. Well, I think I continue to believe, as I believed at my you know family dinner table, that work can and should be something that is energizing, positive, creative, a constructive contribution to the world. And... And I continue to be baffled by the degree to which it mostly isn't. And why is it that we take human capacity and waste it so profligately and that the consequence of doing that is that we fail to solve the big problems in front of us? So I'm a kind of, opt I'm a very frustrated optimist, if you like. I think we've got all the ingredients we need but we keep making really terrible, terrible cakes out of them. And you could say that your first three books, The Naked Truth, uh, Women on Top, Willful Blindness, uh, were kind of expressions of your baffled, baffledness yeah. with, with, the, yeah. with, with the working world, that we've got all these, as you say, all the human brilliance is there. Yeah. And yet we create organisations which overlook it. Well, overlook it, trash it, destroy it, demoralise it. Um, absolutely. And I, th but I think, you know, if we're talking just about my books, I think that 
each one of them I started with a question that, of something specific I didn't understand. And writing the book was really the way to try to find out what on earth is going on. So I was baffled when I was running tech companies that I met personally only one other woman running a tech company um, over the course of eight years at the height of the first internet boom. There were just no women anywhere. So I didn't understand that. This, um, my second book, which is about the rise of female entrepreneurship, was given there was this phenomenal treasure trove of data showing that women-owned businesses lasted longer, were more profitable, employed more people. Um, why was it that nobody was looking at that and thinking that had as a lesson for the business world as a whole? And what were they doing that was making their businesses so so very successful? And then Willful Blindness was hugely inspired by both the, the work I did writing about Enron, but also the global financial crisis when everybody said we couldn't see this coming. And I thought, people are writing in 2005 about this coming. This is, this is not the answer. The answer is you could see it coming and chose not to. So why does that happen all over the place throughout all of human history? Can you tell us, I mean, your, your early career, I mean, working at the BBC, but there's a big leap from uh, executive producing a 13-part series on the French Revolution to moving to the States to becoming a, a CEO. How, how did that transition happen? Mm. And, well, it happened and, partly because I found myself at the BBC um, increasingly the only woman in meetings, um, surrounded by really wonderful people, but who were at least 10 to 15 years older than I was thinking, I'm just going to have to wait. And I'm not a terribly patient person. And also I kept, I was making television programs and I didn't think I was the greatest television program maker in the world. And I thought, I wonder if I'm any good at anything else. And the only way to find out is to try. Um, and then we moved to the States really primarily because I felt then, as well as sadly I do now, um, I felt that the Britain was in a state. This was in, we moved in 1994. I thought it was in a state of disrepair from which it could never recover. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy to say I turned out to be wrong about that. Um, but I thought, I mean, I really thought I'm just too young to give up. And it feels to me like this, you know, the country's on the ground. And my husband is a research scientist and, you know, he was working in a labs where equipment was always broken and he was always having to fill in for doctors who, you know, didn't turn up. And I thought hey, we can do better than this. And we did, you know, you got a position at Harvard and I started running tech companies in the U S and it was a phenomenal experience. And I thought America was at the time, really the best place to work I'd ever been, but I didn't think it was the best place to live. And we moved back to the UK, really because I wanted my kids to grow up in Europe as Europeans. And by that time, you know, I'd run five businesses and I felt I really want to do something that is, I want to do something different. And I want to do something without any employees. I have managed so many people. <laughs> I mean, I'd spent, you know, 25 years managing people. I wanted to do something that was just on my own to get my thinking straight. So, so there were kind of good reasons for all of those sorts of changes. Um, but as I say, I think it was, you know, hugely driven by questions. And, and how to do what we're doing better. Mm. And you worked when you worked with Tom Peters when you were, on yeah. yeah. What, what, were you, what were you doing with Tom? Because that was in, that was in the nineteen nineties, so he was probably at the uh, the peak of his uh, his popularity. Yeah. In, in Search of Excellence appeared in nineteen eighty two, so he was probably riding yeah. still riding that wave. No, he was a very very big deal and a very generous and lovely human being, I must say. Um, so I was working when I first arrived in Boston. Uh, with the software company that wanted to take a lot of Tom's content and um, that not put it online, this is before the internet, but turned it into a CD-ROM. 
And um, and so we collaborated on that. And it was a ton of fun, you know, in the short, brief summer of CD-ROM <laughs> history. Um, and then the internet came along and I was headhunted by some venture capitalists to run one of their businesses. And I kind of never looked back. It's amazing when you look back at CD-ROM, imagine the, the, the mystery of it. You think they can put all the Encyclopedia of Britannica on and one CD-ROM and you were just amazed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it was really cool. I mean, you know, although I have gigantic reservations now about the internet and what it's become, what was compelling at the time was being in a situation where you were doing things that nobody had ever done before in history. And so nobody could tell you how to do it because nobody knew. So this is just unbelievably exciting. And the thing, you know, the, the kind of metaphor we always used to use is, you know, there are no footprints in the sand. So if we said, could we do this? We thought, well, the only way to find out is let's try it. And some of the stuff we did, of course, was completely stupid. And some of it was, you know, really brilliant. And 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 when you when you're in that situation, which I think is really rare, it attracts a certain kind of person who loves the uncertainty of it. They're inspired and excited by the fact that nobody knows. They're not daunted. And those are the greatest people to hang out with because they're kind of by nature optimists because otherwise they wouldn't turn up. And they have kind of energy and they get a lot of energy and they give a lot of energy. And they were just a, and still are a really phenomenal bunch of human beings. And and that made the work, which was excruciatingly difficult, also incredibly fun. And were you a good CEO? You, you say you, you had questions about yourself as a TV producer. What was well, the experience of being a CEO? Was that did you feel you were doing a great a good a good job? And what did you learn along along the way? Well, it's interesting. I mean, many of my employees said I was. And, and still am what, the best person he ever worked for. So that's incredibly heartening. Many of my, the people who work for me have gone on to create their own businesses or to be in really powerful leadership positions. And I'm incredibly proud of what they've done. Um, I think that, you know, I certainly know I made mistakes, but I think on the whole, what I was also struck by is I, I ran companies which three different startups, each of them funded largely by the same VC. And I stayed in that role for longer than anyone else did. So if that's a measure of something, it may just be sheer stubbornness. But I think it was... Um, I think it was certainly a sign of endurance. It was certainly a sign of adaptability because the technology was moving so incredibly fast. So I think I was a pretty good CEO. And you, you weren't tempted to carry on? No, I got completely burned out. Yeah, but And that was fine. Um, but I just didn't. I didn't want to do it again. There weren't any, I didn't have any compelling ideas where I felt I have a burning, burning desire to do this. And I also felt, and this turned out to be true, that um, there was something, um, there was something dark and difficult happening to the web. Um, and this was about the, the rise of Napster, because I remember a recruiter reaching out to me, asking, being interested in my becoming the CEO of Napster. And I thought, no, this is getting ugly now. And um, and I didn't, I didn't like the Napster business model. And I thought there was something really rapacious starting. And I think I was right about that. And I just thought, I don't, I don't think this is where I want to be anymore. I don't think it's going to be fun now. And you, you ran a campaign against a a o AOL, didn't you, in 2000? <laughs> tell, tell, tell us about that, because you, you won an award for that, I think. 
Yeah, we won an award for that. Well, you know, it was one of these really stupid tech fights where, you know, if you wanted to essentially message people and you were on AOL, you could only ever message people on AOL. So it was an absolutely stupid class, uh, classic tech fight, which was trying to own the whole of the internet. And it was a failure to understand because obviously before the web, you had CompuServe and AOL and those sort and Prodigy and those sorts of services. A failure to understand that that world was over and that you couldn't, you couldn't put a wall around online users. And um, and we ran a, a very, I think, I like to think, very clever campaign. And of course, we won. You know, the the standards standards win. Standards win. They always win. And you, and you said you felt burnt burnt out after your kind of CEO experiences. It makes makes me. How long can you be can be effective as a, as a CEO? Because as you say, that kind of positivity and the energy involved. Yeah. Which is hugely impressive when you kind of in, encounter it, but I always think, how long can you keep keep that up? Well, I think that's a really good question, and I mean, obviously, some people can longer than I could. I'm sure. I mean, bear in mind, at the same time, I had two children under the age of eight, and my husband, you know, obviously, my husband worked full time, so that was quite a lot to be doing. <laughs> Um, and I mean, it's interesting because I also think that one reason I could do it for as long as I could do it was because I had children, because it meant that, I mean, my husband and I would kind of trade early starts or late finishes, but it meant that I, you know, half of the time, half the time I had to be home at six. And I think it absolutely kept me sane. And it kept me grounded. And I think that's why many of my peers and colleagues dropped out. Because if you want to, if you want to be a parent, running a tech startup is a hell of a challenge. Um, but if you embrace it instead of trying to run away from it, you know, it'll save you. But um, I don't, you know, I don't think the fact that I got burned out is something that bothers me I think I just I throw myself very headlong into the work I do and I think my work-life balance is huge work peaks and then troughs of recovery and then huge work peaks and then a trough of recovery um, and I think it balances out over a lifetime but I don't think it really ever balances out over a week or a month or a year yeah yeah there's not many people say that their children kept them sane. kept them sane <laughs> oh my children absolutely kept me sane and i think stopped me from becoming a really horrible human being yeah you you, you mentioned the dearth of uh, female ceos at that time when you yeah. when you were working as a, as a ceo and things have moved on since then but, a little, but slowly. Yeah. <laughs> and it, I mean, but it is staggering. I mean, when when we say a dearth of female CEOs and and, and, and business leaders at that time, there was, there really was hardly any of them. And it's not that long ago. It's only 20, 25 years ago. Well, I mean, the first piece of kind of proper writing I ever did was a cover story for Fast Company magazine, which is what prompted the commission of my first book. Uh, called the for, uh, called the female CEO, and it opens with a true story, which is being in a uh, lift in a corporate headquarters in the U.S., and a woman turning to me and saying, "Are you Margaret Heffernan?" And I confessed that indeed I was, and she said, "Oh, I'm just so interested to meet you because I've never met a female CEO before." And I was just flabbergasted by this. And she wasn't saying a female tech CEO. She's just saying a female CEO. And I thought, this is really bad. This is really, really bad. And I think it still is. Um, and I still see women undermined, underestimated, undervalued in very large, very successful organizations that should know better. 
and a great deal of lip service is paid to diversity. Um, I see, I see very little movement. Um, I think what movement there is is much more driven by women who are gutsier and nervier and more determined than they were in the past. I think that's much more the propulsive force than a, a huge change in business culture, which I think still remains very masculine. And I remain really speechless sometimes at the degree to which I see serious senior women, myself included, radically undervalued. I mean, I can remember, and this is not, you know, more than a couple of years ago at a, some fancy drinks thing. And, and I was talking to somebody who was a VC investor and I said, oh, how interesting, you know, what kind of investments do you make? Or what kind of sectors do you work in? And he said, well, let me see, what would interest you? And he talked to me about his investment in fever tree, because of course I'd be interested in my gin and tonic and jewelry company. And I just thought, really, seriously, this is where we still are. And this is in you know many domains, this is where we still are. Yeah. But I think you could trace that more broadly as well. You can say that the kind of enlightened, what, what you could say, enlightened management in organisations has developed really, really slowly over, over the last century, despite business schools, executive education, everyone learning about leadership, diversity being such a, a, a big issue. But the ch change has been really slow at, at, at all levels and in all ways, I think. I, I couldn't agree more. And in fact, I was advising a, a company the other day and um, and this is a it's a very peculiar and very wonderful partnership I have with a, a, a this business where every now and then they ask me for some unvarnished feedback and they mean it, which is kind of incredible because most people say it and don't mean it. And and I listed all the kind of problems in front of them, and I've been working with them for many years now. And I said these this. The most terrible thing about this list, apart from the fact that it's long, the most terrible thing about this list is it's the same list it was when we started working together. In other words, you're keeping up, but you're not getting ahead of the problems in front of you. Now, from my perspective, that being the case, you have to conclude that the process you're using to address these issues is the wrong process, that the way you're thinking about management or leadership or both is the wrong way of thinking about it. And I think you, you know, a lot of soul searching is needed about, well, if our ideas of management and leadership are not getting us out of the pit in which we are currently stuck, hadn't we better get some different ideas? Because if you talk to physicists, for example, they'll say, if your theory keeps not finding supportive evidence, there comes a point where you have to throw the theory away and look for something that's, that fits the supporting evidence much better. And I, you know, when I look at the state of business today and its failure to come to grips with huge problems in front of us. I think we we cannot just keep doing the same old, same old stuff with snazzier marketing campaigns attached to it. It's not working. If I were a cancer patient taking this medicine for the last eight years and I was no better, I think I'd go and get a second opinion. I think you're back to willful blindness again. The, um, yeah. And who, who are your, I know you work as a mentor now, who are your mentors and coaches when you when you mm. work as a CEO and uh, around that time? Did you yeah. have any or were you, were you very much alone? Well, I think as a CEO, I was very much alone. And I think one of the reasons I'm such a huge fan of mentoring is, golly, my life, I think, would have been better and my I would have done my job better, I'm sure 
had I had a mentor. I mean, I had a couple of good, smart, experienced friends who would occasionally um, give me a good dose of reality for which I was, you know, like, like most people, deeply resistant and then deeply grateful, you know. Um, but I didn't have a mentor and it was really lonely, really excruciatingly lonely. And, you know, my husband's a very smart person, um, but he gets, you know, he quite rightly got sick of hearing me bellyache. Um, so I'm a, you know, I'm a very big believer in mentoring because loneliness in and of itself will lead to some bad thinking. But I would say that I had incredible good luck when I was at the BBC working for some absolutely tremendous people. And I was too young and too inexperienced to realize that they really were brilliant. I thought they were just bosses. <laughs> I thought all bosses were like that. So, so what really helped me is I had a, a gold standard that was as high as high could be. And I thought that's the kind of boss I want to be. And that helped me a lot. So it was a kind of mentoring, but they didn't know it and they weren't generally around by then, but they were definitely around in my head. And how, how did you make the transition from being a, a CEO in, in the tech world in the States? You move back to the UK and, and the books start, start emerging. That, that's kind of a reverse transition, isn't it? <laughs> you... Yeah. Um, I mean, how did I make the transition? I just, I just did everything I could think of to make it work. Um, I said, and I, and I think this was the right thing to do. I, you know, I said yes to every speaking engagement I got, which is how I learned to do speaking engagements well. Um, I wrote a lot. Um, at one point, I was blogging for CBS Money Watch and Inc.com which I think I was doing two articles a week for both each of them, which was, it's a lot of output, but it really accelerated my writing and my thinking. Oh, and I was writing for Reader's Digest too, which is kind of incredible. Um, so I just did a lot of it. And if, if you do a lot of it and it's not absolutely the wrong thing for you, you know, the chances are pretty high that you're going to get better at it or somebody's eventually going to tell you to try something else. <laughs> But in your career, it seems like uncertainty, creativity, and collaboration are the are kind of key elements. I think you brought the some of that out in a bit a bigger prize. And I think yeah. I've, seen, I've seen you you wrote something recently about art and uncertainty and how art can help help deal with uncertainty in, mm. in, our, in our lives. But it seems to me that kind of uncertainty and creativity work have worked hand in hand in your career and your thinking as well. They absolutely do. And yeah, so I did a, a series of five essays on the topic for uh, Radio 3, which because those went down really well, I'm, I've now been asked to turn into a book, which is proving a really, really weird and interesting experience, rewriting your own work. <laughs> um, but yes, I mean, I this is going to sound really flaky and there is more to it than I'm going to unpack at the moment. But I think, broadly speaking, that our concept of management, which developed really with the Industrial Revolution, which was about, you know, forecast, plan, execute, scale. Um, I think it was great for then, and I think it doesn't work now. And I don't think it doesn't work because the forecasting stuff doesn't work very well. Um, and I think the way that I've seen up close and personal, deeply creative people work, which is huge tolerance for uncertainty, huge willingness to try lots and lots of things, huge willingness to change before they have to, has profound lessons for what I think of as the new kind of management we need to invent or discover. But our addiction to certainty, as in KPIs, job descriptions, rules, regs, uh, frameworks, all the, you know, shenanigans of bureaucracy and hierarchies and grading everything that breathes. 
imposes such incredible constraint on our thinking that we can't think our way out of the mess that we're in. And, and the people who do that all the time are artists. That's just what they do. And they don't need proof that what they're going to do is going to work before they're willing to try it. And, you know, I often have companies come to me and say, I, you know, can you help us make our people more creative? To which my response is usually, well, let's first of all look at what are you doing to stop them being creative? And all the backpack of management is what's stopping their people being creative. If I have a job description that's three pages long and I have a whole ton of KPIs I have to meet, I'm going to do what I'm told, which means if I have an idea that's different or better, I'm just going to bury it. Um, and if what I'm doing, it turns out to be mad, bad or stupid, I'm still going to do it because that's what I'm told to do. So, you know, we have lots and lots and lots of people in companies, you know, taking the drive to Abilene, you know, this great paradox where it turns out, you know, the story of the drive to Abilene is, I say, do you want to go to Abilene? And you think that I do want to go to Abilene. So you say yes, and I don't really want to, but I thought you wanted to. And so we all get into the car and do a hot, sticky, uncomfortable drive to this armpit town. And none of us really wanted to go there. And all of us had tons of fabulous ideas of a better way to spend the day. But none of those happened because once we had a drive to Abilene on our minds, it never occurred to us to propose anything else. And when I work with a lot of companies, they've already got the drive to Abilene in their mind. And all they want to know is, can we get there faster or cheaper or with more people? And there's a huge mental and managerial blockage to saying, where do we want to go and why? And a huge search for alibis as to why we can't have that conversation. And, and then everybody gets lost and confused and then they go back to business as usual. Now, that's a gross parody of what in fact is happening which is generally that really a waste of a lot of creativity that's almost invariably in the room, but either isn't heard, so it's organizational silence, or it's felt not to be wanted, or in fact it's not wanted, or everybody's thinking the same way because they're all very much the same kinds of people, all the constituent ingredients to willful blindness, fear of conflict, um, and a sense that, well, even if I said something, it wouldn't make any difference, so why bother? So, so I think we are, we really are letting 20th century ideas of management stop us meeting 21st challenges in organizations and business and politics. I think we just can't fix our problems with the tools we're using. Perhaps 19th century rather than the 20th century. <laughs> in some yeah, ways. well, I don't know. I mean, we did some super smart th and good things in the 20th century, but we've sort of failed to build on them. And so we've mostly just left them out in the cold to crumble. Yeah. yeah. So your last book appeared in 2020. So we would be expecting another book quite soon. Um, what, what, are you, what are you working on now, Margaret? Well, I'm working on two books at once, which is a super bad idea. Um, but one is, is the book of the Radio 3 essays, in essence. And the other book scares me so much that I'm not talking about it yet. I mean, it's a radical kind of shift, um, which I'm due, really, because I've changed what I'm doing about every 13 years. Um, but, but it's just a very different way of thinking about the stuff I've been talking about. Yeah. I mean, um, looking, looking at your career pattern, you're, you're just about to, uh, to move into a completely different career at this point. I would, I would, I would think 
Yeah, I mean, about every 13 or 14 years, I blow myself up. And I think I'm, I'm, I'm kind of running into another one of those. All right. So we, we, we wait for the announcement of uh, Margaret <laughs> Heffernan, the, the polar explorer or tap dancer or whatever, <laughs> wherever, wherever you go next. Absolutely. I mean, maybe, maybe. I think, um, yeah, I keep, I keep thinking of various professional suicide notes that I might write and think, actually, don't do that. Do something much more positive. Start thinking much less about what you want to stop doing and much more about what you want to start doing. But they amount to the same thing, I think. Because mm -hmm. I think in the end, you know, and I feel this really strongly, um, the stuff I write about, um, I don't write about stuff I haven't seen. And I don't write about stuff that I don't believe were I a CEO again, I couldn't do. I have a, a real conviction that I can't advise people to do something I couldn't do because I think that's bogus and unfair. Um, so I think if I am critical of organizations who are unable to change themselves, I need to prove to myself that I can change myself. Otherwise, I should shut up. That's quite quite a good edict to carry through through life, especially in the business sphere. What you have seen and what can be done. Yeah, and I do have this really old fashioned view that my word is my bond. And if I write something, I have to act on it because otherwise it's hypocritical. So I'm really careful about what I write. <laughs> yeah, well, well, that makes sense. Mar Margaret, we're, we're out, out of time. Thank you very much for joining us and sharing us fantastic stories of your brilliantly varied career. Uh, people can check out Margaret's work at mheffernan.com. Um, lots of information there, links to Margaret's wonderful radio plays as well, uh, and a whole host of uh, in information and resources. Margaret, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Stuart. It was a really fun conversation. I enjoyed it.